I have not heard from Andre. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, I think I came in at seven o'clock. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, hello and welcome to the December 13th meeting of the Conservation Commission. Commission. Time is 7.07. .07. Um, we have members present. We have me, Michelle Labby, Alex Hoare, Jason Dorney, and we have Bruce Stedman, who I'm bringing in right now. Um, absent are Laura and Andre. Um, okay, so first up, chair report. Um, I have nothing other than we have several continuances tonight, so I'll just announce that if um, anyone's here for um, Valley CDC Ball Lane, um, Wetland Wendell Wetland Services on Pomeroy or Pier Sky on Shutesbury Road and SWCA on lot, at Lot 13. Those are all going to be continued. We will take public comment at the designated hearing time, though. Hi, Bruce. Welcome. All right. I am handing it over to Dave Zomek for a director's report. Uh, sure. A couple of quick updates for the commission. Um, Brad and Anthony are out there you know, continuing to uh, do some early successional mowing. Um, they've done most of the work at Wentworth Farm Conservation Area. They're, they're moving on to Mount Pollux. Uh, they'll do some work off of Station Road. Some of these fields, actually, we haven't, we haven't brush hogged in three or four years. So weather permitting, they're going to keep going and um, see how far they can get. Um, we some months ago through the capital program we were able to purchase a skid steer if you're familiar with what a skid steer is kind of a you know a little bigger than a mini excavator but it um it has a front mower which is very convenient it's challenging to mow a lot of our areas with um, a brush hog so they're teaming up uh, a great example of the use of the skid steer with the front mower is they can mow a lot of the invasives that have grown up around the apple trees at Mount Pollux in the old orchard, um, very difficult to back in a, a, a brush hog to do that. So um, it's a great application. Uh, that skid steer can also help us in-house work on ADA trails, uh, maintaining ADA trails and, and level and, and uh, whatnot, some of those uh, crushed stone gravel trails. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, the Department of Conservation and Recreation in Mass just announced their trails grant program is open. So Aaron and I are um, uh, working with Brad to begin to kind of brainstorm a little bit about um, trails grants uh, that we might submit or a trail grant uh, that we might submit. It's been a while since we've submitted to DCR. It's a rather onerous process. <laughs> Um, so if you go for money, you should probably go for a fairly large amount of money. Uh, keep it simple and keep it big, because if you ask for 20000 it's just as much work as if you get asked for 100000 So um, we're kind of brainstorming on that. If you have any ideas for trails and you'd like to shoot them my way, um, please do. There's plenty of work to be done out there on boardwalks and trails and ADA trails, uh, and the list goes on. We're doing, uh, we're gonna begin in January and February to do some kind of winter planning, project planning for 24. What, you know, what what um, capacity do we have to get projects done in 24? What did we get done this year? We were pretty short staffed out in the field. So uh, uh, our list from 23, a lot of those will carry over. Um, a big project in 24, of course, will be the, the, the trails at Hickory Ridge. Although we won't be doing the work, there will be a lot of hands-on um, uh, project management to do uh, for myself, for Aaron, and likely for Brad. Um, so we will be bidding the loop trail, the ADA loop trail, and the north-south trail. Um, and both of those should be done. Our goal and our grant goal, our grant deadline is, is the end of June. So we're taking those trails through the Design Review Board, the Disability Access Advisory Committee. I just met with them yesterday, had a good conversation. And then on 12-20 next week, uh, we go before the Planning Board for Site Plan Review. And uh, all of those boards and committees are, are great for input on 
design, on accessibility, signage, kiosks. Um, uh, good conversation with the DAAC yesterday afternoon. They're very pleased that we're thinking about accessibility. Um, you know, their focus was on parking, um, on the width of the trail. How are we going to maintain it? Is it going to be open in the winter? Things like that. Um, the planning board, I'm sure, will talk about very, many of the same things, but also, you know, what kind of lighting are we going to have? And the answer there is pretty simple. It's it's going to be dawn to dusk. We aren't going to have any lighting, but is there going to be trash removal, trash receptacles, um, parking, obviously, and how do you get from one point to, say, uh, West Street on our mapping? So all of that is happening now, and then we're hoping to bid out those two projects in January uh, for as early a start as possible in the spring. We've got some good contractors in town. Um, you know, this would be a public bid. So, um, you know, likely, um, you know, probably a four to six week turnaround on the bids. And then we'd lock somebody in and see how the weather is in the spring. So that's the two trails at um, at Hickory. And then um, I don't want to steal thunder from Erin, but um, uh, she was going to give us a, a quick update on the America the Beautiful grant and our role in that grant um, that has to do with Hickory Ridge as well. And some of the ecological restoration we're hoping to do there along the Fort River. So that those are my quick updates. Um, I know you have a full agenda. So um, if anyone has any questions, let me know. Thanks, Dave. Aaron, did you wanna comment on the America the Beautiful? I think congratulations on the grant. Yeah. Um... It was um, sort of a, a joint application. It was actually submitted by um, Mass Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, but we did partner with them. Um, They're working with a couple other cities and towns um, in Massachusetts um, looking to do some significant stream restoration work. And um, Hickory Ridge was the focus of their um, stream restoration work for the America the Beautiful grant and it's I, I mean you guys have heard probably and read some about it already in the notice of intent application um, and certainly the all of the um, work that will be done will be coming back before the commission as an amendment to the um, order of conditions once it's issued for Hickory Ridge but it's looking at removing old fill material from the stream banks. Um, the stream banks on the Fort River are really incised from all the artificial um, sort of maintenance um, over a long period of time. So like if you if you go to Hickory Ridge, you can see that the banks of the Fort River are really steep. Um, it sort of aims to um, do some floodplain restoration, uh, uh, taking down some of the banks to give the river a little bit more of a natural floodplain um, and allowing it to sort of meander more naturally. Um, there's also removal of a uh, bridge, um, one of the bridges that's on the trail system um, and uh, placement of woody debris. So like there's a lot of, in most rivers you see like more woody debris um, versus in the Fort River, there's not a whole lot. So there's sort of a lot of restoration components that are associated with restoring the river um, and Hickory Ridge will be the focus. So it'll be exciting to see it come before us. It's um, I think a $3.5 million award to the state for the project. So we're a piece of that and should come with some um, assistance in the form of staff as well. So it'll be exciting. Aaron, could I could I just add one other element of that is um, the federal grant will uh, pay for the removal of the building that is associated with the irrigation system. Uh, the irrigation system for the golf course irrigated the the, the full 150 acres and caused quite a bit of riparian damage along the Fort River Bank. Um, so this grant will pay for that removal. So that's a cost that the town will not have to pick up. And uh, that'll save us a considerable tens of thousands of dollars, uh, maybe more actually in the long run. So that's gonna be a, a great addition uh, in this grant. Excellent conservation work happening at Amherst. Thanks guys. Um, 
Andre, welcome. Just for Bruce, I think you're taking minutes and thank you again. We got Andre on a little late. Um, all right. So moving on, we have review and approval of the 11, 29, 2023 minutes. Um, Alex had some comments. I looked them over. Um, I don't know. Did anyone else have a chance to do that? There's, I think, mostly to do with Alex, if you're there, chime in. Um, just defining some acronyms and um just kind of definitions. So nothing huge, but um I'm comfortable with the changes just for their records. Any other comments from commissioners on that? Okay. Well, Bruce was author. Alex is not with us anymore. Hmm. Yeah, um, I just want to make sure that before we vote on them, that everyone's had a chance to review Alex's comments, just because I put in a ri an original set, um, which folks may have had time to see, and then I just uploaded Alex's comments late this morning. So um, if folks haven't had time to review them, I don't want to sort of um, rush folks to approve them too um, quickly. But it's really... Okay. If Andre you've had a chance. Uh, yeah, uh, just from my part, I have not had a chance uh, to review them, and I would like a chance to do so. Okay, Jason. Same. Okay, we have a bit of a backlog of minutes, so maybe next time we could put a bunch on the queue, and we could just go through them and approve some minutes. Does that sound good to everybody? So maybe just next time, give it, give them some looks, and we'll just get that done. All right, so we're gonna table that the 11, 29 minutes till next time. Um, sound good? Okay. All right, not yet 7.30. So other items of business, do you wanna issue some orders of conditions while we're waiting for our 7.30? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I put in your packets um, draft orders of conditions for three different um, properties, uh, 370 Northampton Road, uh, 28 Greenleaves Drive, and then 191 West Pomeroy Lane, which was the the um, Hickory Ridge Trail project. Um, <clears throat> Bruce jumped up with a question. So. Yeah, just finish and then we'll ask yeah. questions. Um, <clears throat> so each, each order of conditions is a little bit different, um, sort of unique to the given project. And so um, I don't know if you want to go through them, if you want me to pull them up on the screen or how you sort of want to handle um, uh, going over them, but they're they're in the folder if folks want to review them. Yeah. Um, do you want to just pull it up on the screen and maybe we can just start with the Northampton Road? Go ahead, Bruce. Well, it seemed as though Alex was out of the the whole thing when we decided to postpone the minutes that he commented on. So I just want to make sure he understood what the decision was. Okay, thank you, Bruce. So Alex, if you were gone, it seemed like you dropped off for a second. Not all the commissioners had an opportunity to review your comments, so we decided to table it and do a big batch of um, minutes reviews next next meeting. Does that sound good? Okay. Thanks, Bruce. Um, all right. So as far as Northampton Road, do you want to bring that one up? And we'll just start there. I had one comment on it, um, but I'll maybe it's sort of at the end. So if anyone has sequential comments, we'll start there. Go ahead, Bruce. Okay, your hands down. Um, all right. Any comments from commissioners on this? Okay, seeing none, um, looks great, Erin. My only comment was at in the perpetual conditions towards the end. I just was going to suggest that we, um, so there's a condition that no herbicides except for organic pesticides, herbicides, fungicides be used. Um, subject commissioner review. So um, typically in restoration, the herbicides and pesticides, fungicides are not organic. Um, they are deemed wetland safe um, solutions, but 
they're not organic. So I just thought maybe taking out that criteria and make it more general in case there is a infestation later on down the road um, and leaving it up to commissioner's discretion, what types of herbicides might be used. So I and just want to, before we make this change, I just want to point out a couple quick things. The first is, um, and I'm sorry, I didn't mention this earlier today, Michelle, when we talked. Um, the first is, so there's a couple different um, places where in an order of conditions, we might see herbicide applications. One might be if they have a um, invasive invasive management plan that's associated with an order of conditions. I think that these conditions are more geared toward, um, for example, people not treating lawns uh, for, you know, just in general, unless they specifically have um, a invasive species management plan. So I think that these these boilerplate were set up basically as just a standard that unless you have a, um, an invasive species management plan that you shouldn't be applying any of these. But I'm completely fine and I agree with your comment. Um, that we should take that out that it it's and and really what i'd like to do is just remove it um holistically from our boilerplate because it doesn't really seem to make sense and i'm not sure why that was even in there to begin with but just a general comment yeah that's a good point i mean assuming that there'll be some kind of lawn care we want to leave open you know some kind of window for them to be doing that on their own without having to come to us um, it almost seems like there should be another sentence that is about like domestic um, landscaping versus a actual treatment of some kind of invasive infestation. So I, I mean, off the top of my head, I'm not sure exactly how to word this, but my concern is just I want to leave open the, the possibility for the commission to use herbicides or tools other than organic ones for treatments that are necessary just to protect the wetlands in general. So... Yeah, I mean, I think we just remove the word organic for these three orders, okay. and then sure. from there we can maybe wordsmith something for that specific perpetual boilerplate condition that um, tackles the issue at hand. Okay. Um, any comments on that, commissioners? Okay, hearing none, I think we need an order to approve. Right. I mean, a um, motion. So I didn't actually, I, I didn't actually draft the motions for this, um, but um, really um, all we would need is a, a motion to issue um, the order of conditions for 370 Northampton Road, noting the DEP file number with the um, uh, standard boilerplate for state and local and special conditions, but I'll, I'll try to draft up a motion right now because I see Alex has his hand up. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Alex. Alex, you have the floor, but I can't hear you. I'm wondering if he's having some technical difficulties. We can see you. You're, you're on mute right now. Can't hear you. Not oh, again. No. no. <laughs> okay, gonna reboot. All right. <laughs> All right, we'll see you in a sec. Okay. Um, do we actually need Alex on this boat for a quorum? Um. He, he yes, I think we do because Andre wasn't here at the last meeting. Um. Let me just. Yeah. We, he. I've got to draft this uh, language anyway, so I'll give him a second to get back on. Sure. And while she does that for green leaves, I just had the exact same comment. So that would be all I have for that one. Do you want me to pull up green leaves while we're just waiting? Sure. OK. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? 
We can yes. welcome back. Yeah, okay, so I rebooted my camera. My question when I had my hand up was well, back on the pesticide issue if the word systemic would work. I'm not sure I completely understand the difference between that and non-systemic. Well, you, had, you heard the word organic and systemic. They go in if they go into the water. They're systemic if they go into the water. There are also broadcast sprays that are like more or less soluble in the water and um, more friendly to amphibians. I don't think that I completely understand um, pesticides enough to to put a descriptor on that um, and leave open, you know, innovation so that maybe just leaving it open without the word organic. Yeah, yeah they, also give... kill, they also kill bees. Yeah, yeah. well, I just want to leave it to the commission to maybe make the decision later on without um, okay. tying us into, is that okay with you, Alex? Sure. Okay. All right, um, with that, I guess we're looking for the motion. Yeah, you're sorry, I'm it up. bouncing back and forth between screens. Bear with me. No there we go. <clears throat> so we'll just start with 370 Northampton Road. This is just a general motion, so you could just insert the address and the DEP file number for each of those, but we'll just start with 370 Northampton Road. Okay. I move to issue an order of conditions for... 370 Northampton Road, uh, DEP file number 089-0726, Hawkins Meadow. Um, with the boilerplate state and local conditions and special conditions as noted. Second. Andre on the motion, Alex on the second. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Bruce is an aye. Alex? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, bear with me while I pull up the 28 green leaves. So very similar. Um, on green leaves, there was not the specific language about the wetland delineation. And the reason for that is because the wetland delineation was originally tied to a 2004 order of conditions. And we also had a, a DEP file number, I think it was uh, 711, um, that was issued immediately prior to um, this permit coming about. So I did make a note um, at the top of this um, at the top of these conditions that basically note the connection between this order of conditions, order of conditions 402 and order of conditions 711, so that it was clear that they were all sort of tied together, historically speaking. Um, but other than that, it was just sort of our standard special conditions and boilerplate. Okay, any comments? No. Okay. Same deal. Looking for a motion. And um, mm -hmm. Michelle, you wanted to remove organic from this one as well. So that was just language that would change so slightly. Yeah. And maybe we can think a little more and talk a little more about what we want that boilerplate to look like. But for now, I just don't want to constrain any kind of future decision making based on that. Okay. All right. Well, I'll move to issue an order of conditions for 28 Green Leaves Drive, DEP number 089-0723, with the boilerplate state and local conditions and special conditions as noted. Second. Jason on the motion. Alex on the second. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Alex? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Are we, okay. If there's any public comment on this, please raise your hand and I'm going to not mind. Keep a, keep an eye on it. 
Okay. Do we want to just do West Pomeroy before we move in? Yeah. Okay. Um. Sorry, I'm bouncing between two screens that I'm on a remote computer. So I'm, uh, yeah. All right. So um, this is the order of conditions for the Hickory Ridge Trail project. Um, so we've got the standard boilerplate. I also have the um, NHESP determination letter issued here um, so that it's rolled into the order of conditions. Um, um, yeah, and just some kind of site specific, um, conditions that are a little different associated with this for, um, stability, uh, to make sure the site's stable, to make sure there's inspections going on. Um, and so I, they're kind of tailored to each, each individual permit. Can you scroll down a little bit, Aaron, please? Of course. Yeah. I can zoom in too a little. I don't know how far down you want me to go. I don't know. So do we have the native planting condition on this one? I just didn't see it. Um, Should be. I can add that one in. I'm not sure why that one didn't make it on there. Jason, go ahead. Um, I have a comment on special conditions number seven. It's that weekly inspections must be completed during construction phase of the work. Monthly monitoring reports to be submitted during the construction phase of the Conservation Commission. Inspections may be completed by contractor, can be informal email. Are these meant to be the same inspections that are required by the construction general permit? <laughs> That's a really great question, and I'm so glad that you asked it, Jason. So on this project, it's a little bit tricky um, because it's a town project, and we don't have a separate wetland um, monitor, so to speak, who's out there doing the inspection reports. So for the sake of the town going out to bid on this project, I rolled in the construction monitoring so that the SWIP reports and the um, reports to the Conservation Commission can be rolled into one. However, you know, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of staff visibility on this project. Um, I'll be out there monitoring it. I'm sure Dave will be out there monitoring it. And as well, we have a um, um, an engineer who's doing special projects in town who's also going to be monitoring the work. So there's going to be a number of staff that are going to be on site um, daily, weekly, as this work is going on. So that is a great question and it is a little bit different than how I would ordinarily condition a project because of the sort of staff oversight that's going to be happening um, from the town while this is going on. Um, so just for clarification then, those weekly SWIP, required SWIP inspections will be the ones that are emailed to, you know, are informally emailed? Right. Okay. So then those those uh that person then who's doing those inspections needs to be qualified yes under the construction general permit correct I, okay i just want to make sure that this is not in any way um stating that the inspections the swip required inspections are informal when they require a person to be trained right and and just to also clarify because this is a, a uh, something I didn't mention before when Jason was asking about this. The erosion control inspections are separate from the SWIP inspections. So I fully expect will be copied on the SWIP inspections, but the erosion control inspections for the Conservation Commission will be separate inspections where somebody's going around taking photos of the erosion controls and reporting any repairs that need to be made. But yes, um, the person who's doing the SWIP inspections and the erosion control inspections on our bid documents is going to have to be qualified to conduct those. So they will have to be trained and qualified to conduct SWIP inspections. Um, and the contractor that's selected is going to have to be qualified to um, carry the SWIP and do the SWIP inspections on the town's behalf. All right. I do have another question slash comment, if any, so. 
Um, one of the things that I would like to see in here is the, only the use of biodegradable erosion control blankets or any kind of blankets like that um, with the sensitive nature and the habitat. Uh, I wouldn't want to see any kind of compost or any kind of erosion control blankets that have netting in them to snag wildlife. Um, that's a big problem. And especially in areas where they may go down and they may get forgotten and then they may never come up. Um, so I would like to, if we can, state that no erosion control blankets containing netting can be used, either temporarily or permanently. I'm all for permanently. That's a good point, given the sensitive habitat. And I've heard that snakes can get caught in their nettings. Um, snakes, yeah, lizards, I've seen birds turtles. Caught in them. Bird. Okay. Yeah, that's terrible. So let's yeah. go for permanently. Yeah, I think that's a great, great addition. That would be a great addition to the boilerplate too, actually. <laughs> I would love to see that. Yeah, maybe. Especially let's when they this. get, you know, you can't necessarily be everywhere all the time. And sometimes they do get left behind. And uh, if you've ever seen a, a DOT project with a large mower, grab a, an erosion control netting and rip it out. Uh, it's from a from an erosion sediment control standpoint, it's not a pretty thing, and from a vegetation standpoint, it's not a pretty thing either. So, I would love to see that become boiled. Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll add in condition on native plantings and uh, prohibition on um, erosion control blankets that contain net netting, and they're required to be biodegradable if they're used on site. And going forward considering putting that in our general boilerplates. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Jason. Go ahead, Bruce. Um, my concern is there's a lot of things here and there's a June 30th deadline. And I just would like some reassurance that we can do all this and still be able to spend all the money. Yeah, I mean, we're on track. Um, we're going to be going to bid very soon. And I think that the work is anticipated to take about a month and a half. So the portions of the work that need to get done for the grant, I think we're pretty confident we'll be able to get done. Um, there are portions of work that are associated with this order of conditions that aren't associated with the grant. So for example, the um, culvert um, removals where we're doing stream restoration, those are are not tied to the the time sensitive grant um, application. So uh, there are bits and pieces of this that will be fast tracked, and bits and pieces that are going to take a little well, more time. Maybe that was what I was trying to figure out. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Anything else? Okay, seeing none, I guess we're looking for a motion with some of the set changes. With all of the set changes. I can uh, make a motion. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, before making a motion, I'm, I'm just going to point out, uh, from my opinion, Jason, your point that uh, you made about the uh, that matting is uh, is is a really good point, and uh, I would also like to see that on on boiler plates. So thank you, Jason. Um, yeah, thank you. I move to issue an order of conditions uh, for 191 West Pomeroy Lane uh, with a DEP number 089-0721 with the boilerplate state and local conditions and special conditions as noted. Second. Uh, do we need to state the insertion of the two conditions? Um, I think we we noted them on the record already, so I think we should be we should be okay. But I'll make sure that the changes make it on to the um, the formally issued order of conditions. Okay, thank you. Okay, we had Jay's, um, Andre on the motion, Bruce on the second. Andre, aye. Alex, aye. Jason, aye. Bruce, aye. And I'm an aye. And Bruce, your hand is still up, just in case that's not intentional. Did you have something else to add? No, sorry. All right. All right. So, so let's um, 
Move on to our hearings. Okay, so general procedures for fairness to all applicants. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda. The hearing structure will be five minutes presentation by staff, five minute comments from applicant, five minutes for public comment or two minutes per person, five minutes from the conservation commissioners or two minutes each. All revisions and materials are required by the Wednesday, a week prior to our meetings by noon on that Wednesday. And for all presenters, please clearly state your name, the address of the project, and who you're representing, as well as if you have any preferred pronouns. So this hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Bylaws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of the wetlands, as most recently amended, and Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst Bylaws. This is a notice of intent for a Horsley Witten Group Incorporated Dinisco Design and Brown Sardina Incorporated on behalf of the town of Amherst for the proposed reconstruction of the Fort River Elementary School and associated infrastructure, parking, stormwater mitigation, ball fields and landscaping, and the demolition of existing school building, removal of existing infrastructure, pavement and mitigation measures at 70 Southeast Street, map 15A, lot 47. Okay, Erin, do you want to fill us in to start? Sure. Um, so just a quick update. Um, I did provide um, staff comments to the applicant on December 8th. The applicant did respond. Um, we received comments back actually today. I did take a look through the um, responses that we received. I realized the commission hasn't had really a chance to review those and they're like 230 some odd pages long. So if the commission wants to take time to review those responses, you're certainly more than welcome to. I did sift through them today um, to try to just keep the ball rolling as quickly as possible. And um, I submitted in the uh, a couple follow-up comments, questions to the applicant's representative, which I put those documents in the folder if you want to sort of boil down to what my questions were. Um, otherwise, I'm going to yield the rest of my time to uh, the applicant because this is a huge project and they're probably going to need a few more than five minutes. <laughs> Okay, so I brought Amy in and I think Janet. If yes. there's anybody else in the audience, okay, please raise your hand if you're part of this application. Welcome, oh. Amy. Welcome, Janet. Good evening. Okay, I see Rick. Okay, Aaron, I think we're both working right now. Is Tim Cooper a part of this project also? Yes. Okay. Is Margaret Wood also part of this project? Yes. Okay. Okay. I think you should all be here. Um, okay, welcome. Do you guys want to give us a presentation of this project? Yes, thank you. Um, good evening for the record. I'm Amy Bald from the Horsey Witten Group. I'm the senior ecologist here. I'm gonna run a really quick slide deck for you. Um, Aaron said to keep it short and sweet. Um, it'll be an overview. And then the members of the project team who are here, Janet Bernardo, she's my um, the design engineer. Uh, Tim Cooper, Rick Rice from Tenisco are the architects and Margaret Wood is the owner's project manager. Is that correct, Margaret? Um, is it okay for me to share my screen? Please go ahead. Okay. Um, very briefly, this is the Fort River Elementary School's existing conditions here. And the proposed project is the redevelopment of the school as the, um, the public advertisement states. Uh, we have gone through an ANRAD process uh, about this time last year, and uh, an order was issued on uh, February 14th this year. Um, so we have a number of resource areas that are all associated with the Fort River and or the Faring Brook. Um, of the resource areas that are on, on the larger school property, uh, BVW um, 
areas subject to storm flowage, uh, boarding land subject to flooding, and the buffer zones are what will be affected by the project. Um, the pro proposed project is a, a complete redevelopment of the school uh, with the important caveat that the school needs to remain in operational um, during the approximate two year construction period. So it will be a phase construction, um, really consisting of three phases, uh, one being an early site preparation and then a phase one and a phase two. The early site preparation will happen um, uh, permits granted uh, at the beginning of this next year uh, with the um, taking the existing stormwater offline, to putting it into a temporary system to manage stormwater during construction, uh, a changing of the traffic patterns and um, preloading the uh, soils for the existing school, adding a RAM aggregate piers. Um, and this is all providing structural support for the building, which I'll let the architects talk about a little bit more. And then the phase one, which is uh, focused in the more southern portion of the property, is the actual construction of the building itself, the stormwater, the new um, bus route and drop off area, all of the play areas and um, the infrastructure that goes along with that. Once phase one is complete and the school, the new school is online. Then we will switch to phase two, which is the deconstruction of the existing school and ball fields. And at that point, we will also provide some additional mitigation areas in terms of additional uh, flood storage and um, uh, restoration of a wetland area. Uh, the site drainage design, which I'll have Janet go into more detail on as necessary. Um, involves a number of different types of stormwater practices to address the, the various areas, um, including cache basins and area drains, uh, sand filters, a bioretention area and a rain garden, um, stone infiltration trenches, vegetative filter strips, I'm reading need to. There are two um, proprietary practices that we are also proposing, uh, the rain guardian foxholes and the rain guardian turrets. Um, in addition, we'll also have some permeable play services. Um, we presented these uh, images, I think, to the commission back in about September, mid-September, uh, with sort of a pre-permitting uh, presentation, and just wanted to call your attention to, this is what a, a rain guardian turret is for the commission members who were not present at that time. Um, but the sand filters that we have, these are all examples, are likely to be much more vegetated than um, these pictures indicate. Um, and the bioswale will also either be um, more gravelly or will have some vegetation depending on where it is located. As far as resource area impacts, and this is something that Erin brought to our attention this afternoon that we didn't quite clarify it the way um, she anticipated. This is just directly from our project narrative. Um, we have about 44, 45,000 square feet and cubic feet of ordering land such to flooding impacts, but we will end up at the end of the day with a net gain of more than 19,000 cubic feet. Um, in terms of BBW alterations, there are about 1,800 square feet of um, BBW alteration that is uh, in an existing degraded state, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, with an ultimate restoration area of about 4,700 square feet. Um, the area is subject to storm flowage, which is something that came up during the ANRAD process. That will be, um, all the interests that are protected by that area will be incorporated within the design. Um, and then as far as buffer zone um, impacts are concerned, we have impacts within the zero to 50 foot buffer and within the 50 to 100 foot buffer of both the BBW and the um, BLSF. And this is more of a qualitative um, response, which is that among the alterations that are proposed in these areas, we will be providing compensatory flood storage as well as additional flood storage and the wetland restoration area. Um, and then finally, we also have uh, two in, uh, state listed species uh, along the border. And um, the alterations within the mapped habitat are about 800 square feet. Um, I mentioned we have two additional restoration areas 
uh, there along what we call wetland B, which is to the north and uh, directly east of the school, and then wetland area C. These two are actually part of the same boring vegetated wetland system. The wetland restoration area, there were some photos in the, in the report, but this is uh, different times of year, but the swing set that uh, currently exists in the north of the school property is uh, being overtaken by some Phragmites, and is uh, which are maintained um, by the school so that the swing set remains operational. And there are uh, wood play chips that have been placed directly in the wetland. And we discovered that the wetland boundary actually encompasses most of that um, the swing set. So the proposal there is to um, remove that fill there, remove additional fill about a foot and a half or so adjacent to um, the swing set area, removing the shed and all of this grass area and restoring this about 4,700 square feet of BBW. And then for additional flood storage, um, that will occur along the area of wetland C, which is this long linear finger of wetland, um, and will uh, again result in a net uh, gain of about 1900 cubic feet of flood zone. And we'll be doing this by pulling the contours back and removing some of the, these are existing um, gardens. All of the mitigation that we've just discussed will need to happen during phase two because this is this would um, change the condition of an operational school. And then I mentioned again, we have the uh, rare species habitat. We have not yet heard from natural heritage. They've issued a, um, a tracking number. Uh, we understand that we will hear from them on the 22nd of December. And so we've already you know, sort of mentioned to Aaron that we will need to uh, request a continuance to your uh, one of your January meetings uh, in order to allow us to get uh, feedback from natural heritage. And with that, I'm sure I've talked for much more than five minutes, but I figured I'd turn it back to the commission for questions and discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Was there anyone else from the group that wanted to add anything before we move on? Okay, I don't see anybody. We're gonna just go to public comment and we're gonna be doing two minutes per person. Please raise your hand if you have anything you'd like to add at this time. Okay, I'm seeing none. I'll keep an eye on the the room. Um, okay, to commissioners, commissioners, comments, questions. Okay, Erin, I see your hand. It. I'm just gonna let you go first. Yeah, I just need to ask a a, a really important clarifying question before we get too deep in this. And um, Amy, forgive me because I think we're we're on the um, alteration versus mitigation numbers. We might be crossing paths a little bit. Could you put the table back up for just a second that you were presenting um, your resource area impacts? Um, in your presentation, uh, the reason that I'm I'm queuing in on this is because <clears throat> I want to be extremely clear about something. Based on what you've said to me, the buffer zone impacts, quote unquote, impacts that you're proposing here are actually mitigation in the buffer zone. Some of them are, and um, I. We'll have to drill down to the numbers, but I think about half of the buffer zone will also be sort of repurposed or reconfigured into new playing fields. Um, and I think a portion of the um, access driveway goes into the 50 to 100 buffer. Um, but yes, that is that is true. And we'd like to try and, um, you know, get those numbers for you and okay. clarify them. But that okay. That is that is the gist of it. The existing condition of the buffer is really just all of the open playing fields. Got it. So if when you do your when you do your um your number accounting for us, mm -hmm. if you could just separate out the sort of buffer zone alterations that are going to be field or driveway or you know sort of the uh, permanently maintained used areas, separate those out from the comp storage areas the you know that are going to be like pollinator meadow or the flood storage areas um the wetland restoration areas 
I just want to make sure that we're seeing actually apples to apples comparison and that you're not grouping the restoration mitigation work into the alteration category. I think um, what we did here. Okay. I just yeah, want to make sure you. that that's happening. So that's, that was my comment. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And I, I was also going to ask about that. So I'm just going to jump ahead of the commissioners. Um, yeah, just a table showing sort of the existing conditions, the the temporary and the permanent alterations, and then the associated um, by category buffer zones, um, the, the comps and the mitigation, just something we can go across the row and, you know, see a tabulation that is not just qual qualitative, but also quantitative. quantitative. Yes. Thank okay, you. thanks. Great. Okay, Jason, go ahead. We discussed a number of things at the site visit um, regarding erosion sediment control during construction. I think most of them were captured, Aaron, on the comments. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask is, it appears that DPW is not going to be doing the maintenance on the post-construction BMPs and that that's going to be up to the school. Um, I'm a little concerned with the number of different types of BMPs that are on the project and the potential complexity, and some of them are likely going to include confined space entry. Is the school in any way, or the school district, it sounds like they're going to just have to put this out to bid for a contractor to, um, to do all this work. Is there, I'm just a little concerned that one that's going to be prohibitively expensive. I saw an estimate of about $12,000 $12, a year. Um, has is, How did you all arrive at that number? And, and overall, again, my concern is that this is going to be very expensive for the school. I, I think you want me to answer that? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, for the record, my name is Janet Bernardo. I'm a professional civil engineer with the Horsey Witten Group. Um, as far as how we came up with the number, we tend to, every kind of area is slightly different. We have a general idea of how much it costs to bring a VAC truck on site and clean out catch basins. Some contracts are different than others. So we, we kind of wait to figure out what the, what the, uh, product owners can come up with. A lot of the work might be um, easy pruning of work that could end up being put out to a local garden club or a college school that is, you know, is interested in helping. But we try to kind of come up with a cost that if they put it out to bid, that's what they might look at. So the goal is to understand what the what the intention is. Um, we had not heard that the DPW was not going to get involved. So you have more information maybe than we do. So we were waiting to hear from the DPW uh, and understand what they were looking for. Rick, you have a an yeah. I, uh, Rick Rice with Denisco de Design. <clears throat> Routinely, uh, I've been told that the school department maintains their uh, sites and storm drainage systems unless, quote, they have a problem that they need to reach out to DPW on. Uh, DPW was going to review and get back to us today as to how it might be broken down, but I didn't hear from them by the end of the day. So I suspect it will be a combination of school department, DPW, and and uh, subcontracted labor in order to make the uh, uh, maintenance requirements happen. Thanks. So I, I'm hearing that we need to have some conversations with the school um, staff and DPW in the town about this, um, just to determine the capacity of each of the departments to handle some of these specific stormwater um, criteria is and this is something that we can't answer tonight but I, I think Aaron you've already mentioned that you had some concerns about this and it's been discussed so we'll we'll get back to this one with some further information yeah okay I'll move on to Alex go ahead Alex yeah just uh, I have two things but this uh 
subject with the school and DPW is covered in Aaron's December 8th comment letter, point number two, where she come she she brings up this whole subject. So it's it's been up there. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. And then uh, my, yeah. I didn't know if Aaron was trying to say something. Anyways, I have one other item that is uh, uh, nothing to do with the school. And that is that I saw a public comment in the folder. Um, <clears throat> I think Aaron posted it on Monday. And I came in from, I think it was Mary Maria Becky. And I, she, I kind of thought she would be on to bring up her points. If she called in and um, I was kind of expecting when I read her, I thought she would be on to tell us about them. If she is absent, I wonder if um, Aaron could brief us on what she had to say. Yeah, so I think she's... I but she's not absent. She's in there. And I think maybe I saw Dave hands go up in response to the DPW comment. So maybe we could just tie that one up. And I do want to get to that, Alex. So Aaron, okay. Dave, do you have anything else to add before we move on? Yeah, just yeah, to, just to my good Michelle, to, to tie up the 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 annual maintenance of the of the stormwater system. I just want to make sure, you know, just the message I, I think I'm hearing is to the Denisco team. Uh, I just don't want Aaron to be saddled with getting the answer to that question. So it's really on the on the team. You know, I'm I'm happy to have those conversations with with uh, Paul Bachelman and Guilford Mooring, but um, I think Aaron, you know, should should uh, take a little step back from that, and and uh, so. Just wanted to put that message out there yeah. that I'm sure Denisco can work with Guilford and the school department and figure out how that's all going to be divided. I, I heard what Rick said. Maybe it's a kind of a one third, one third, one third kind of thing. But yeah. uh, let's let's get that in writing and and uh, come back in January yeah. when, no, when you we, we did we did pose the question and forwarded the ONM manual to both DPW and the school department on the eighth and you know through. Uh, the beginning of the week, they were still working on a response. We hope they have one by tonight, but we are, we came up short on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see a lot of parallels, you know, when, when we're, we're building a, a school that is this uh, kind of forward looking and energy efficient. Um, we're going to have very complex systems on the inside of the building, and we're going to have pretty complex systems on the outside of the building, all of them to, save energy and 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 create a great work a great uh, learning environment inside for teachers and families and and kids but on the outside it's a pretty complex system too so i'm sure we'll get there thanks thanks dave so hopefully we'll have some more details on that next in january um okay um moving on we did have some public comments so commissioners this was in the packet it's in relation to uh the poured rubber um, I guess foundation for the school playgrounds. And this is relevant to our jurisdiction because there is a stormwater drain from the playgrounds that empties into riverfront. Is that right, Erin? And it, definitely into resource. It empties uh, into bordering land subject to flooding, but it's it's um very close to okay. um riverfront area, which is a uh, critical area of cold water fishery. Okay, um, so this type of material is known to have contaminants that aren't good for people or ecology, and that is the concern. So um, the letter was pretty good in outlining some alternatives and provided some, um, basically a table of other alternatives. And I'm my question to you all is how have those been considered and are there ways to get away from that poured rubber? Um, base. Yeah, I think uh, Rick Rice is going to yeah. take this one. Yeah, we were uh, made aware of a uh, Gordon Place cork base product at the uh, uh, school building committee meeting on Friday. Uh, I, uh, our OPM uh, had done some research the last couple of days 
uh, and we're looking into it. Um, maybe Margaret, you could talk about what you found was basically that as far as storm drainage goes, it it is at least as permeable, if not more than the poured in place uh, rubber that we've based the design on. And uh, this is a very new product and we are, the team is looking into it. Okay. Yeah, I don't I don't really have anything to add to what Rick said. I, I think um I appreciate that Maria brought it to our attention. Um it's if anybody's interested in looking it up, it's called Corkeen, C O R K E N. I haven't seen what Maria sent in, but they have a good website. It's a Portuguese product that is a sort of side sideshow of the cork industry in Portugal. There is a company um in Baton Rouge who installs sort of up and down the East Coast. I have been told, although I don't know the name of the project, that, that it's been previously installed in a school in a Northeastern Easton, uh, Massachusetts, and that there's another project underway. So we're hoping to get a look at that. Um, I've left message for the landscape architect who worked on that project, and um, we're definitely in the throes of actively looking into it. Great, thank you. That's good to hear. Commissioners, any other questions or comments? Okay, I'm still not seeing any public comments. So I think um, at this point we have some items to get some more information back on and we're looking to continue this to January 10th. So I see you, Janet, go ahead. Yeah, one just one thing to make sure the commission's aware of. During phase one, there will be, which is when we're building the school and building the playground and the pathways near it, we will have a small about, amount of filling within the bordering lands to flooding that we will be compensating for at the time as part of the phase one project. So we have additional storage during phase two, but we will be providing compensatory flood storage during phase one. It's just It's just a semantics thing. I just wanna make sure that you know that it's happening. <laughs> Thanks. Um, that reminds me, I, I don't think I mentioned this, but in the table one, when we talked about, um, you know, row by row, type by type um, impacts, maybe it would be helpful to also see what the phasing schedule is for those things. So. If it's a it's impact in phase one, but it's going to be mitigated in mm -hmm. phase two or three, that might be just helpful mm -hmm. for us to look at for yeah. the you know, project scape. We right. can put that in writing, but just so the commission is aware overall, what we call the early site package, we anticipate being under contract in March and starting in April. That contract goes until August of 24 at which time the general construction project begins. And then all of phase one, all the site development, the new building and the site development south of that line that divides the existing site and the new site would be occupied for the start of school in September of 26. And then the building comes down and the rest of the site is developed to the north. Okay. So, so that's a big picture. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see a public hand raised. Um, go ahead, Maria. Hi, thank you, Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. I just want to appreciate the CONCOM for uh, taking up this issue about uh, trying to eliminate or severely restrict, hopefully eliminate the rubber port in place. And I want to appreciate uh, Denisco looking into the cork-based product um, just uh, for completeness sake, uh, the other products that uh, I hope would be considered in combination or uh, so on would be possibly the bonded engineered wood fiber or just loose fill engineered wood fiber in other areas. Uh, I think it's really important that we have um, an exterior and a site that is as awesome as the net zero uh, aspect of the the school building itself is going to be. So I really appreciate any efforts to to make that happen. So thank you very much to to all of you. Thank you, Maria. Okay. 
when I was there, it used to be gravel. Do you not do that anymore? <laughs> it was a little unpleasant, but <laughs> no. Okay. It was stone. It was like little pea stone. Yeah, I remember getting I, hit in the it gets eye. stuck in your shoes. It hurts when you hit it, but um, it's permeable. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Commissioners, we're looking for a motion to continue this to January 10th. Aaron, do you have something you could put up for us? I will move to continue the public hearing for 70 Southeast Street, Fort River School, NOI to 735 p.m. on January 10th, 2024. Second. Okay, that was Jason on the motion. Was that Andre on the second? Okay, Andre. Aye. Jason. Aye. Alex. Aye. Bruce. It's an eye and I'm an eye. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you very thank much. You. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, on to our notice of intent for Stonefield Engineering and Design LLC on behalf of Valley Community Development for the construction of a 15 residential duplex structure and associated site work, including parking, utilities, stormwater management, and landscaping within the buffer zone at 20 to 40 Ball Lane, Map 5A, Lot 56. This is being continued, um, but if there's any public comment and it can be quick, we can take that. Just raise your hand. Not seeing any. Um, I'm looking for a motion to continue this, Commissioners. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, I hope this is permittable, uh, even though we're continuing it. It has to do with the name of the project, and maybe Dave can shed some light on it. It's it's referred to as Ball Lane, which is a private road. And there are, there are conditions on the road that a person can only drive in as far as his residence and can't go any further. And every time I've talked to people on the road and every time this thing hits the paper, people drive into Ball Lane and want to go look at the project. Is the entrance to this project, is there, I didn't see an entrance to this project on Ball Lane. I missed it. I thought the entrance was on uh, um, Pulpit Hill Road. And Dave, maybe you can shed some light on why it's called Ball Lane instead of Pulpit Hill Road. And can we change the name to save the people who live on Ball Road the, the annoyance of people driving in? Um, well, I I think I, I earlier saw Laura Baker on the call. Laura represents Valley CDC. Um, I don't know all the history. There was initially looking, you know, there was a look at Ball Lane for an entrance. You're correct, Alex, that the entrance will be, be off of Pulpit Hill Road, but I would prefer if the uh, if the applicant um, I don't um, see that applicant responded. Here. I thought Laura was here earlier. Are they continuing tonight, Aaron? Yes. Anywhere? Yeah. 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 So they might have left, but I think it I think it initially started out as Ball Lane, and it probably just carried over, but. Well, the property address is Ball Lane. So yeah. the, the previous there there was a previous um business that operated on the site, which the driveway came off of Ball Lane, which was associated with the parcel as a whole. So in the assessor's property record, it's listed as 20 to 40 Ball Lane. Um, they are proposing to eliminate the connection from ball lane to the project and have a separate driveway entrance but until they you know until the the site is reclassified with a different address by the building inspector and or the assessor's office that's how it's classified in the um, town's um, property records and, and i think the residents of ball lane are well aware that that you know the, the permanent entrance to the new development won't be through won't be through ball lane some are not aware. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been many opportunities. They've had site visits out there that are open to the abutters, et cetera, et cetera. So I think Aaron is is spot on with why it's called that. But it's clear that from the plans that the entrance will be off of Pulpit Hill. Well, 
maybe we maybe we'll just leave it at that, but maybe we could hasten the changing of the name. Well, I can add a note when I read the um read the Thank application you. next time. If yeah, please feel free to remind me on January 10th. Okay, Bruce, go ahead. I agree with Alex. I, I went on the site visit and I drove down the road because I didn't know where I was supposed to go. Hmm. I drove in there and was told I shouldn't be there. Yeah, I mean, I I think we should, as a given the amount of work that's going to go on there, I think we should do everything possible to make it uh, a positive public uh, engagement. Yeah, I, I I guess what I would say is I would leave it. I would leave these comments to the applicant when you see them at the next meeting. I, it's not really up to okay to make that change. It's really up to the applicant. So I'm sure Laura I, will address it. I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. I understand it. I just wanted to put it forward and um, hopefully it'll come up again. And thank you. Thanks, Alex, for thinking about those residents of all Um Okay, looking for a motion. I move to continue the public hearing uh, for 20 through 40 Ball Lane, NOI to 740 p.m. on 110-24. I second. Alex on the motion, Bruce on the second. Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And I'm an aye. Squish your hands up. It's multitasking, yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to just use my own hands. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so next we have a notice of intent for Wendell Wetland Services on behalf of Eric Olson for proposed restoration of a 2300 square foot man made pond by dredging and replanting at 296 Pomeroy Lane, map 28D, lot 6. So I think we're still waiting for some information from this applicant and we're moving to continue public hearing. If there's any questions, public comment here. I don't see any questions from commissioners or the public, so looking for a motion. I move um, to continue the public yeah. hearing. 7.45 p.m. on uh, 110.24. I'll second that. Alex on the motion, Jason on the second. Andre? Andre, you're muted. I'll come back to you. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. I'm an aye. Uh, I still don't see Andre. Um, do we need- I'm an aye. Okay. okay, thanks, Andre. Okay, next up, abbreviated notice of resource area delineation for Pierce Cry Development Incorporated on behalf of WD Coles Incorporated represented by Goddard Consulting for the confirmation of resource area boundaries on site limited to areas that fall within the 100 foot of the proposed solar installation at Sheetsbury Road, map 9B, lots 11 and 12, and map 9D, lots 27. Again, this is going to be continued. I see your hand up. Go ahead, Erin. Just to give a very quick update to anybody who might be on related to this one, um, the peer reviewer did visit the site um, on Tuesday, I believe, um, and yeah, yesterday, and uh, completed a, a full day of um, site work on on the property, and uh, we're basically going to be sort of regrouping and uh, meeting with the applicant in the near future, but. Um, until there's information to share with the Conservation Commission, we'll need a continuation. So the applicant did submit that request. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, if there's any public comment, please raise your hand. I see Alex's hand up, so I'll go to you, Alex. Uh, Aaron, I was just curious if that was a sort of a closed uh, site visit or would it have been possible for some of us to go there. I know there was already a site visit. Some of us missed it. Yeah. And if, if there was a private site visit for the peer reviewer so that they're not influenced by anything, will there be an additional opportunity to visit the site? 
Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, we can certainly have a conversation on it. Um, so we have a a quote from Emily to do sort of her standard. Um, Emily Stockman of Stockman Associates is has been our peer reviewer since I've been um, working with the town. She's excellent. Um, and and ordinarily, when we do a peer review, um, what happens is they they give us a quote for um, com conducting the peer review, um, and they do it sort of in an independent manner. So um, in this case, the applicant actually gave Emily permission to visit the site on her own. So she was on site completely on her own yesterday for a full day of um, site investigation. Uh, the idea being to kind of give her some freedom to explore the site and kind of form her own judgments on uh, where the wetlands are located. Um, sh typically what would happen um, once she's done an initial investigation and, and sort of um, determined where she thinks there might need to be changes or adjustments, she would then meet with the applicants, um, wetland scientists, and they would meet on site to basically review her findings. And it would essentially result in, if there are changes to the delineation at that point, that's when the changes would be made, theoretically made or not made, depending on if they can agree on the changes. Um, ordinarily, the commission is not involved unless or until there's a dispute. So for example, if Emily was to find something and say, I think this is a wetland, and then um, the applicant's representative were to say, I don't think this is a wetland, um, then you know, there could theoretically be an opportunity for the commission to come and view it and render their own decision based on the um, documentation that's provided to them. Um, but on a typical basis, there wouldn't be um, sort of uh, the site investigation wouldn't happen with the commission present. Um, so that's sort of just the standard way of doing it. But, um, you know, I think we're going to just take this one step at a time. And if there is um, a need for the commission to get out there on site with Emily, um, absolutely, we'll make it happen. Um, just sort of will depend on the cooperative nature of um the review process in general, I think. Thanks, Erin. Um, anything else? I don't see any public comment. I keep doing that. Um, all right, looking for a motion to continue. I move to continue the public hearing for Shootsbury Road in uh, ANR AD to 7.50 p.m. on 1.10.24. I'll second that. Alex on the motion, Jason on the second. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. Hey, last up, I know I... Okay, so we have Tetra Tech on behalf of Fort River Solar 2 LLC for construction of an operation of a 6.3 megawatt direct current ground malted photovoltaic solar facility and appurtenant components at 191 West Pomeroy Lane, map 19D, lot 10. And who do we have here? Aaron, are you bringing? So, so we... Um... We had an SWCA continuation that fell before this one, but we oh, can sorry. come back to that after this. That's that. No, that's totally fine. Um, so I'll, Sean Foster and if, I think Matt Moyen. I'm going to pull in. Um, if there's anybody else that I missed, feel free to raise your hand. Let's not forget to extend that SWCA. I'll bring. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Is everybody in? Lawrence is not yet. Okay, we have Matt, Sean, and Lawrence. Welcome. All right, Erin, would you like to give us an update? 
Yes, a uh, quick update. So um, just to give a little background snapshot of where um, the review process thus far, um, I issued staff comments to the applicant on November 8th. Um, the applicant, um, it may have been a little before then, so they could respond. The applicant did respond, provide comments back um, immediately after that. Um, I had some follow-up comments um, on uh, December 5th, and the applicant responded to those comments as well. Um, and uh, we're, I think, at the point now where we're we're getting very close. It's I feel like it's sort of the home stretch on this one. Um, to um, I'm starting to formulate conditions. Um, there are a couple sort of outstanding questions um, which. Uh, I've noted on the slide, which I'll pull up, um, but there's, uh, I think we're just getting sort of the final pieces in place and the final, um, really the fire department is kind of um, who I'm waiting to hear from at this point. I think that there were, um, there's now agreement between the DPW and the applicant on um, the access over the sewer line. So I think we're sort of closing in on um, being ready to close, but I want to give the applicant an opportunity to address any of the um, final comments or questions, and um, we can sort of figure out where to go from here. You're muted, Michelle. Thanks. All right, go ahead, Tetra Tech. Would you like to respond, present, give us an update? Yeah, we. Um, I spoke with Erin earlier. We we replied to you know, um, think all of her direct comments as under the Wetland Protection Act. Uh, we have been in touch with the fire department, who've indicated that, and I think we we're going to request that we could just condition any any coordination with them um, for uh, separate permits for some of the uh, equipment on site uh, that, that needs permits through the fire department. Um, that way, you know, we wouldn't, you know, potentially, you know, uh, continue this hearing again with the fire department having their own separate process um, to, to review that material. Uh, but I think all the all the questions on the Wetland Protection Act, I believe, have, have been uh, been answered, and including we, we did get an ESHAP uh, uh, response indicating they approve our revised plan set and the conditions were made the same. And we got a permit uh, extension to 2030 to complete all the mitigation that we're required to complete. So I think that's a, a big piece of the, the puzzle that was kind of outstanding last time we spoke. Um, so. You know, I think we we're just asking if the the fire department work could be conditioned with the understanding that we we have been per sky has been in touch with them and and been coordinating with coordinating with them uh, on several several items that uh, we don't anticipate to impact uh, any of the the kind of scope under the jurisdiction of the Wetland Protection Act or under the under this this kind of uh, public hearing process. Thanks, Sean. Go ahead, Lawrence. Thank you. Yeah, just to, just to add some colour to that, I spoke with Captain Bascom earlier today um, and uh, explained to him the questions that had come up from that. Um, uh, as, you, as you're aware, there was, a, there was an incident with a fire at a, at a powering location um, in New York. Um, we can't discuss uh, openly uh, the, the RCA on that. It'll be a subject to an NDA that will be coming in the fullness of time. Um, I spoke to Captain Bascom and he, he sort of indicated that we've, we, we've got to get a permit from the fire department anyway to be able to install the batteries um, separate to the CONCOM, separate to the zoning, separate to the building and electrical permits. It's a fire department permit and uh, he would not be issuing a permit if we haven't been able to provide him uh, the information that he needs to uh, to um, say that it's, uh, it's safe from a uh, fire safety point of view. So we're asking that uh, we... Uh, just formalize the, uh, that in the condition to say that uh, the applicant will be required to go through the uh, Amherst FD uh, permitting process for the battery storage. Okay, thanks. Um, any public comment, please raise your hand. Okay, I'm not seeing any yet. Um, go ahead, Andre. 
Yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure that I've heard uh, this the point addressed. If you can put that the uh, that um, PowerPoint back up uh, briefly, uh, the second to last uh, point about the town engineer having agreed to a, a grass pave product to be used on the sewer line access through the uh, through the array uh, that the changes need to be incorporated in uh, uh, on the plan and essentially any changes like that. Um, would you uh, folks mind addressing that uh, question? <laughs> yeah, so the the, the town engineer, um, I think, you know, gave a little bit background to, to the how we got here is is previously that there were panels that were um, some of the panels and associated racking was over the easement uh, and discussions between uh, Pierce Guy and, and the town engineer was to, you know, remove all like structures associated with the project outside the easement so they could access it. Um, but what they were also looking for is if they ever needed to access, access that section of the easement, say in an emergency situation, right? They could, they wouldn't sink down into the ground and be stuck in the mud and kind of just destroy it. So what we came up with as a, a kind of a, an agreement was to do some sort of um, grass reinforcing, right? Um, that usually it, it can be a proprietary system or it can just be some engineered solution where you put like a geogrid beneath the ground that kind of gives it a little bit more stability that you can, uh, you know, uh, drive lighter vehicles on top of it. But the maintenance of the grass would still be the same um, as the, you know, the rest of the, it would be the same seed mix, same, um, uh, topsoil thickness and, and kind of same, I think there were some conditions related to how tall the grass would go. So that would still be maintained, but if they ever needed to get to that area, it would um, it would have a little bit more stability to hold up kind of lighter trucks and, and smaller pieces of, of a, like a backhoe or something if they needed to get in there. Uh, and that's what the concern from the town engineer was just making sure that once they got off the access road, uh, the kind of the stabilized access road, it wouldn't just, their trucks wouldn't get stuck like in, in the muck and, and kind of just, you know, have to have to build a road in there per se. Um, we found this, we, I've used this product in other places and it's a little bit more effective because it, it makes it, I find it looks like kind of the rest of the area once it grows in, um, as opposed to like, um, sometimes you see like pavers or pavers with holes in them. You can still see it when the grass grows in. This allows the, you know, it, it's it's not gonna look, you know, it, it in theory, it should look the same as everywhere else on the site. It's just that if you drove a vehicle on it, um, it'd have a little bit more stability. That makes sense, Sean. Um, what uh, I, I guess my uh, my concern is that uh, is that it should be in the um, in the incorporated in the plan. Um, yeah. So, so I, I, we, yeah, we we so we committed to to putting a, a note and a detail into the plan set. Um, I think this. I think we provided the the revised plans last week and we since then we've talked to to Aaron about just you know we were committed to putting that in the compiled um you know the compiled uh permit set at you know um you know at, at any when requested or whatnot but it wasn't a, an oversight I think just the timing of the exact detail and, and sign off from the town engineer was um want to make sure we had that all before we put uh what we're going to put on the plans but yeah we're committed to um, I think I put in an email to Aaron that, you know, we were committed to doing that. It's going to be on the plans. Um, so we're not trying to <laughs> get out of it by any means. So. Yeah, thank you, Sean. I appreciate it. Uh, and, and also just to provide some additional color, obviously there's, there's nothing there at the moment. So if the town does need to access it to, to dig it out, then this is, uh, this is an improvement. And, uh, it was a miscommunication, which is why it was an oversight when we discussed with the town, um, it, it was just to leave that area clear so they could access it um, to be able to get the equipment in um, based on what it currently is. Um, I, I believe that putting a road or something in there would, would make it harder for them to dig down uh, to access it. So we're just going to make sure that the manholes are, uh, are kept open for them and the rest of the area will be uh, reinforced with this, uh, this grass pave. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, quick question for Sean. Sean, I might have misheard you earlier, but did you make a comment, a reference to, was it your, the the 
the CMP and getting an extension from Natural Heritage on the, the implementation of the mitigation plan to, to 2030? Correct. Mean, yeah, correct. So our current permit, I believe, expires in fall of next year. Mm -hmm. So two things we need to do first, get an extension, right, um, of that permit until 2030, because the, the, the and, and this is outlined in the notes sheet about the phasing, there's several years of mitigation that need to get done. So that was that was part one. But we also at the same time, provided them at the initial plan set that we produced um, we, we gave that to them and informed them of the changes, um, and they, we discussed it with them, and um, they, they concurred that the changes were in general conformance with the previous CMP, and, and they provided an extension. Uh, and I believe they also provided a letter directly to Aaron and, and members of the board, just kind of outlining and informing them of, of that decision. Um, it, it, it is included, th those correspondence with NESHAP are included. Um, in could, the attachments to the response to comments we provided, could yeah. you or could, could you or Lawrence comment on? Um, I'm I'm a little a uh, little fuzzy on your commitment in the mitigation area to the. How long are you responsible for the success of the plantings in the 17 acre mitigation area? Well, uh, you, you're putting me on the spot a little bit there, Dave. But I think it's um, I think we're two years. It's the establishment phase, which I believe is is, is either two or three years. Oh, yeah, maybe three years. Okay, no, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I was just trying to make the connection. But your intention, yeah. your intention is to get the mitigation area, you know, uh, start start in the spring. Yeah, yeah established the... as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. So sorry for clarification. Is that the mass heritage well heritage CMP criteria, or is that the town's criteria? That three year performance. I, I believe that was the the state. So it's called the habitat management plan as okay, part of the CMP. Um, All right. So we have it, no jurisdiction over that um, monitoring period. Then that's all state permitting okay well, we we will i mean we'll, you know we're party to the cmp so we will definitely be working with with pure sky and tetra tech and you know we will be keeping a close eye on that on that area um after those years then you know that becomes a permanent feature of the 150 acres that 17 acres north of the fort river um is really that mitigation area so it's, it's Okay. An, an important area for sure. I was just thinking about, you know, being clear about successors and assigns over that three year period, um, given that, you know, there's turnover. Um, I, I believe it's laid out in the CMP, uh, okay. the responsibility, and then the, the, the town um, takes over from that. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Alex. Sorry, I keep you waiting. You're muted, Alex. Now, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I have sort of two points uh, on the same, in the same subject matter as to do with the fire department. And I, I hope I misunderstood uh, what you were saying. I, I thought what you said was you wanted to disconnect you're proceeding with the Conservation Commission from your communications and need for a permit from the fire department, such that we would be not privy to the fire department. And did I get that wrong? Uh, you did to a certain extent, yes. So the uh, the the safety and security of the fire uh, of the battery storage itself um, is. A fire department um, consideration rather than a concom one, and would be done through the permitting. It's, it would be up to um, Captain Bascom uh, as the permitting issue if he wanted to consult with the concom or any other town departments. Um, in terms of the containment and um, protection of resource areas, uh, that is most definitely under the concom purview and has been uh, addressed in our in our submissions. Yeah. Okay. So. The sensitivity for me was that we have been very much interested in uh, fire related subject matter having to do with batteries. 
And I was going to ask Erin if she could just remind me how we handled this situation when we were working with the battery storage on uh, out there on um, uh, in Sunderland. And we were concerned about fire and we were concerned about containment of uh, materials used to put out fire and that kind of stuff. Um, we were in communication or knew what the fire department uh, interests were. And I don't remember us necessarily becoming divorced from uh, the fire department in the process. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I appreciate everybody's comments. I mean, I think what's what's difficult for us is while the fire department's ultimate approval of what the battery system setup is, is, is at the discretion of the fire department to make those decisions where it results in a potential change to our plans is where it kind of becomes our issue. Um, I know we have a couple plan adjustments that we had talked about um, earlier today. For example, the dimensions of the equipment pads were missing. We talked about what was going to be done underneath the um, new construction trailer location. We have that grass pave um, issue with where the actual grass pavers are going to be located um, in the um, eastern array. Um, the um, potential for you know what's going to happen with the equipment pads and sort of the layout of everything and you know as it pertains to our our permit what what happens when we issue an order of conditions is we reference the plan set that's that we have that is the most up to date um, from our permit application and so if there are changes to the plan set after our permit is issued then what that means is that they would have to potentially come back to us with an update and amendments to the plan to get approvals for changes. Um, and so that's that's where it's tough because, I mean, we, we went, several commissioners probably remember us going through six iterations of administrative changes to the previous order of conditions. And it's, um, it's very challenging to go through that process because we basically have to rehash everything every time there's an amendment. And certainly the preference from a staff standpoint would be for us to have finalized plans that all departments are on board with and sign off on. And we issue the order of conditions and it's like a clean order of conditions and there's no changes or adjustments. And granted there may be that are out of, out of our control. For example, like, um, the, uh, we talked a little bit offline about this, but for example, concrete the, foundation. come again, concrete foundations. Well, you know, that's something that I, th so <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, I yeah. was going to mention the interconnect, the oh, okay. utility interconnect, because there might be some poles that, that, um, Eversource requires for the interconnect mm -hmm. that we can't really, we can't say definitively are going to be required now or not. It's up to mm -hmm. Eversource, right? Um, but so, but since that that issue was brought up, um, I just want to mention a couple things, which are I have been talking offline with Sean about conditions, and that that those conditions do potentially um, adds some additional management to the plans as they're currently proposed. And I can give you some examples of that. Um, Lawrence just brought one up. So, um, some of the questions that I asked to Sean offline today were about the number of pilings. So essentially the supports for the, the solar panels themselves. So the number of pilings, the number of panels, and the number of pilings per panel. And the reason for those questions were because I was talking um, internally to our, we have a um, an engineer on staff who answers a lot of stormwater questions for me. And it's been really valuable. And actually, to the applicant's benefit, quite frankly, because when I have questions about the stormwater management plan, I have somebody to go to who really knows um, the answers. And so it it makes it so it's a lot more seamless for me when I'm reviewing things. Um, but 
you guys may recall the members who were here for previous minor administrative changes that one of the changes was that there was a potential need for um, modifications if if there was a, a, a pile. So they're hoping to use um, driven piles for the supports on the solar panels, but there may be instances when they're installing the the piles for those panels that they hit resistance and they have to put in a more um, substantial footing. And so in some cases um, requires sheeting on either side of the piling, in some cases requiring um, concrete. And so one of the things that I was requesting um, in the details and in my comments was a, um, a spec for what those foundations would look like, which they've provided to me, which is wonderful. Um, and so now the question becomes, so we know that the they're hoping to use the piling, but there may be um, need for them to use a couple of the foundations if they hit resistance, if they hit ledge or something like that. And so part of what I was hoping to build into the order of conditions is something to the effect of, and this is just me sort of spitballing, but I'm just throwing this out there for the sake of discussion, like they could potentially... Um, use the concrete foundations for say 20% of the overall pilings. But once they exceed that 20%, they'd have to come back to the commission. And the reason for that is because those concrete foundations weren't accounted for in the stormwater plans. Now, speaking with our internal engineer, it really probably won't impact the stormwater that much, but it's, um, you know, as we discussed when we talked about those, when you're installing a pile driven support, you're using pressure to drive it into the ground. There's really not a whole lot of material that's coming out of the hole. When you're putting in a, um, um, a, a dug foundation, you have a lot of material that's coming out. And so where is that material going? Is it being stockpiled? Is it being taken off site? Is it being dewatered, right? Um, we have high groundwater on the site. When, we, when those materials are dug, does that mean that that material needs to be dewatered? And so there's like all these sort of ripple effects that happen when there's a need for those types of structures to be installed, which we have to manage that and come up with a plan for that. So it provides them conditioning it on some level provides them some flexibility. So if they need to install a couple of them, they have the flexibility to do it. But it doesn't mean that, um, like, let's say there's 500 pilings on the site, they couldn't do 500 of them, right, um, without coming back to us and letting us know. Similarly, um, one of the things that was really a concern to me when I was reviewing this was we have two arrays on this site, the eastern array and the western array. This is ballpark, but the Eastern Array is approximately eight acres. The Western Array is approximately 12 acres. They basically wanted permission to just install both arrays at the same time. And my concern with that was these are very large footprints and we're talking people getting in there with equipment, putting in trenching. Um, th there's a lot of vehicles traveling in and out of the site. There's there's excavation that's happening. There's a heavy equipment that's tracking over this. And so it introduces a lot of disturbance. Now, as part of their SWIP, they're only allowed to disturb up to five acres at a time. So having access to install on almost 20 acres is a pretty substantial um, amount of disturbance, in my opinion. So another um, condition that we had discussed offline was since we were sort of having um, I don't want to say a disagreement, but the applicant felt like we should be able to install these at the same time. And for financial reasons, we need to install them at the same time. And from my perspective, I'm saying we need to protect the resources and we can't have this entire site opened up. So the um, compromise that we arrived at, which I put a lot of thought into and came up with this suggestion was on the Eastern Array, which is approximately eight acres, in order, that would basically be phase one of the array installation. In order for them to move on from the Eastern Array to the Western Array, they would have to have stabilized three acres of the Eastern Array before moving on to the Western Array. So they could, they could still be working on the Eastern Array, but start working on the Western Array. But they would only have permission to begin on half of the Western Array, the first half of the Western Array. And once they... Um, have stabilized the entire Eastern Array, they can move on to the second half of the Western Array. So you see, I'm trying to sort of do this piecemeal so that we're getting some stabilization 
as they're moving through the site and not just both the sites opened up. But these are some of the conditions that we've been talking about offline. Um, and, and again, it's very fast and furious because um, we're trying to sort this out quickly as we go back and forth with our comments. And there's, there's a couple other, um, you know, conditions that would be associated with some of the back and forth with our comments that we've already discussed. Like, for example, if polls are added for an interconnect, they'd have to come back for an amendment from the from the commission. Um, the construction sequences would essentially be considered phasing. They'd have to report to me as those phases are being completed. We'd have to have some open dialogue. These phases, this phase is being wrapped up. This phase is looking to begin so that I can be on board with how that's working. This is a very large site. So I wanna make sure that we are in the know with how the process is moving forward. Um, and Sarah, then, do you think we need to go through all of these right now? I'm just trying to keep an eye on the time. And I mean, that that was a lot. And I think yeah, um, giving it in like a, you know, once you and Sean have had some more back and forth, um, having it like for us to review would be super helpful. But yeah. that was really good background. And I'm hearing building contingency into the plan set so we don't have to go back for all the amendments. I think we learned a lot from all of those amendments. I don't know how many commissioners were there for all of them, but there's a lot of things that we can just go ahead and um, get into the plan sets on the get-go. And Erin has a lot of foresight on that now. Um, I'm certainly supportive of the phasing that she recommended. And I think probably now you know where staff stands on that. Um, so unless I don't see any public comment, please raise your hand if you have anything over there. Um, I just want to circle back to the fire department and DPWs, like those conversations um, might end up having some implications for our jurisdiction. So I think it would be prudent for us to wait to hear what they want and then make sure that's in the plan set. And I just want to prevent this, um, the multitudes of revisions and amendments that we went through last time, because I think we've learned a lot in the past couple of years from doing that. Um, any last comments from anybody, questions, um, anything from the applicants about um, what you need to correspond with us or Aaron? Okay, I see a, sorry, I heard, go ahead, John. I was just, I said, I think we're, I think we're all set. Great. Um, I do see a public comment, so I'm going to allow Matthew to talk. Welcome, Matthew. Sorry about that. So Matt Moore, our touch tech team, I got I got booted out a little while ago and have just been listening in as attendee. Um, just real quickly as it relates to the DPW and the fire department, I think we've gotten the closure we needed from the DPW in writing as to what their expectations are. And as Sean indicated before, we plan to include that information on the, the final compiled plan set. Um, the, the fire department probably more concerning to me at, that the commission's considering extending this this process contingent upon however long the fire chief needs to to complete his process and his review. Uh, it sounds like we all understand that if there are changes to the plans resulting from the fire chief's review and his permit process, we would have to come back. And in a perfect world, yes, we would have that all wrapped up on this final set of plans. But what I don't want to see happen is that review take months and have you know it's outside the purview of the commission have that hold up um, closing the public hearing and issuing an order of conditions when there's a separate process that we should be respecting that the fire chief has in place uh, and, and also just to, just to throw in some color and context around that the batteries are the last thing to go on site we need site power um, to be able to operate the hvac and life support systems for them so the the site goes live uh, with the witness test for the pv and then we install the batteries. At the moment, Eversource is telling us that it's a late September it is when they would be able to um, provide us with a utility interconnection. So the batteries aren't going to go on for probably nine, 10 months from now. Um, so we do have plenty of time for the uh, the fire department and if necessary for us to come back to you with any to incorporate any minor amendments with anything that he may wish to see as part of that permitting process. So it, it it's, it's not like we're looking to uh, get on and install a battery next week and the fire department aren't going to have any time. That's that's certainly not the intention. We're going to have a, a, a long and detailed chat um, with all the departments um, to to be able to uh, make sure everybody's happy with, with everything that's there. 
Okay, fair enough. I guess I'm nervous that we have no ballpark about um, what that might look like. So if there are early um, updates that you can give us, that would be helpful. Um, Aaron, did you want to respond to that? I see your hand, Andre. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I agree with the applicant um, on some level about getting fire department sign off. And I'm, I'm definitely sympathetic to that concern, I guess where my concern does fall. Um, no, well, so there's two issues with the fire department. Number one is the battery and the battery storage and the cabinets that are associated with that. So that's sort of number one. And number two is confirmation of the access roads. So the, the access roads, this is what I understand from speaking with um, uh, Mr. Bascom is that, and I'm sorry, I don't know what his official title is, so I'm doing my best, but he said that, um, Ordinarily, the access roads would have to be 20 feet wide, but in this case, um, there was a um, provision granted for them to have a 15 foot wide access road, which is essentially like a variance um, from the 20 foot wide access road requirements, but that they had to have additional turning radii that were added um, in order to accommodate them pulling in and turning around. So I have a call into them, but <clears throat> I'm just... I, I'm between a rock and a hard place, I guess, because I don't know if the access roads are going to change. And so <clears throat> I think it would be good for us to get some confirmation on the access roads. And also um, it would be good to get some feedback on the battery storage. It doesn't necessarily mean that the, the fire department has issued their permit. It doesn't mean that they've uh, uh, approved everything that's being installed per se, but just to say we've reviewed the plan and we don't think that there's going to be any substantive changes to the conservation permit as a result of anything we may require. I think that's the sort of confirmation that I'd be looking for. Um, and part of this, so for context, we had another battery storage site in the town of Amherst where they were proposing similar battery storage cabinets and the we, they worked with the DPW to have a roof system put over the top. And the, the purpose of the roof system is basically to provide, number one, containment that doesn't get stormwater influence, and two, to protect the batteries from rainwater um, so that they're not, like, you know, damaged. So if there's a roof structure that's added over the top of this, that changes the plan to some degree as well. So if the fire department was to require some sort of a um, cover over the top of the of the equipment pad that that, that would also trigger a change to our permit so <clears throat> I'm I'm I see it from both sides and I'm understanding and I certainly don't want to be unreasonable it's just that mm. I think it, it's going to get we don't want to go through multiple administrative changes and I think that that's where I'm concerned to try to limit that to the degree that we possibly can yeah uh, if we may uh, good Lawrence so I was just going to say, I, I understand that entirely, but the, the, the reality is that if the fire department has a permit because we haven't been able to satisfy them, we don't install batteries at all on the site. So it's um, it, they are more the gatekeeper um, in terms of us, uh, the ability for us to put it on there. If we put a roof structure over, which, um, uh, as you would know from conversations that we've had, it, it is unnecessary um, due to the design of these cabinets. Um, I don't know. The, the design of the other ones. Um, but the, the way that these are done, um, it, it, it's relatively unnecessary. Um, but we'd also need to, I would have thought, go through a zoning variance as well for, on, the, on the special permanent site plan, um, because that's a structure that would, they'd, they'd need to consider as well. So um, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to go through the kind of the, the what ifs at this stage if it's, uh, if it's unnecessary. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just want to piggyback on that real quick, Aaron, if you don't mind. Um, I certainly understand exactly where you're coming from here. And fortunately, this this process includes opportunities for administrative changes to address all these what ifs. And the project's at a point now, it's a little unique where we're filing a notice of intent after we've already received the building permit. So presumably, the fire chief has reviewed the access roads, which were constructed under the prior order and are not part of this filing. The, the access roads are an existing condition in this filing. So I, I get your concern, but it's not something that's part of this, this notice of intent filing. Um, and, you know, ultimately there are processes in place that address these what ifs. And we're just looking for the commission to 
to respect those other processes and I, ideally focus primarily on the jurisdiction that you guys have review uh, over. Okay. Um, so I'm a little bit concerned about uh, what you're what you're talking about there, uh, Matthew, and uh, a little bit about what um, where this part of the conversation is going here. Um, you're uh, we do have uh, you know our concern is is like you you were saying before, Lawrence, is with containment. Um, now, depending on what goes on between uh between you and the fire department um they may ask you to do something that uh that may change the uh the containment aspect or how how much uh, you can contain we're concerned about what uh what might flow out of that what might flow out of the uh, battery area uh so we do have um you know i can i can tell you i have some concerns about that so uh let's you know, we're we're gonna. I think everybody's gonna be reasonable here, but uh, uh, I I do want you to know that I'm concerned, and I think uh, we've heard some concern from some of the other, uh, uh, from at least one of the other uh, commissioners. Thanks, Andre. Dave, you want to jump in? Go ahead, Dave. You wanted to jump in. Yeah, I was just gonna maybe offer some guidance here you know all along you know um conservation staff zoning staff planning staff and the fire department have worked you know side by side to to work with with pure sky and their consultants moving this project forward through the permitting process so i i was going to step in if or jump in a few minutes ago when alex asked a couple of questions about kind of parallel pathways of communication all along there's been good interdepartmental communication and this seems like a point where that would be very beneficial um and you know i'm happy to to work with aaron to get the fire department make sure that uh the zoning folks are with us as well with matthew with with um with uh, the team from tetra tech and um and pure sky and and get in a room and and see if we can get to to some resolution on these and bring them back to the commission. Having said that, I am sensitive to the length of time that some of these things may you know that the fire department may not make a decision and give an okay on the kind of batteries that they are going to approve for that site for some time. So I, I am a little sensitive to the applicant about approve, or excuse me, about holding this matter that long when there are opportunities. And but I get it. You don't want you don't want the applicant coming back for uh, small changes, amendments along the way. But um, as Lawrence said, it could be 10 months or more before installation even takes place. So but I'm happy to pull that group together with Tetra Tech, with, with uh, Pure Sky, and have that conversation and see if we can bring something back to you at your next meeting, if that would be helpful. And I'm curious Thanks, if, yeah. if Aaron would, would be supportive of that as well. I mean, I would like to see some weigh in from the fire department. I don't think, you know, like everyone's been saying, we need to sign off on a permit necessarily, but just some kind of review and initial input on whether or not we're going to be, you know, moving roads or putting anything significant in that we should be considering that is under our jurisdiction. Okay, lots of hands up. I'm going to go to Jason. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I just am wanting some clarification as far as the relationship here between what the fire department needs to do and what we are looking to do and what the applicant is worried about. I understand that the fire department can potentially take months to make some decision. What is it exactly that they are asking of us? And just can somebody clarify that for me? I'm, a, you know, obviously I'm, I'm somewhat new to the board here and, I just want to make sure that I am clear on what's being asked of us and uh, what the, I understand the objections to fire department's input, potentially changing plans, changing, 
you know, impervious surface, things like that, as well as I am also concerned if there's a fire and it has to be put out, what is going to be running off of this site? What is going to be running out of those batteries? So I'm just looking for some clarification as far as what is being asked of us tonight. I think we're trying to give the applicant some guidance on what we'd like to see in the plan set before we close the hearing on this and the detail which we do it and how much um, of that should be nailed down from input from the fire department and DPW. But if there's anything else, Aaron, you want to add? Yeah, I mean, just ordinarily, we would have the, the plan design sort of solidified and finalized before we close the public hearing. And so if there's still outstanding um, design details uh, that aren't shown on the plans, it's it's somewhat risky to close the public hearing because um, we have once we close the public hearing, we have 21 days to issue the order. Um, in this case, our next meeting is um, January 10th. So um, it's basically, I'm not even sure we it may even put us over 21 days if we were to close the hearing tonight. Um, but if, you know, we're basically, we're closing the public hearing, not seeing a final plan set. And so that's the risk that we take. Usually you want to see that plan set. You want to verify, okay, all updates have been made. All final changes are included in there. There are, like I noted, um, a couple additional um, things like the dimensions on the equipment pads, the area under the trailer, whether it's going to have hardening or not, the grass pave, um, final approval of the access roads, the um, equipment pads. So like those types of details, like like to have those all settled out and a final plan and we issue the approval and then we have a final plan set to to reference in our order of conditions. But, and, but it's my understanding we're not going to be closing the public hearing tonight. There's a continuance on the... Yeah, but we'd like to move forward in that regard and hopefully do it to the next one. So we're trying to give as much as possible in terms of guidance, the applicants, so that the next meeting we could hopefully get somewhere with that. Um, okay, I, I see all applicant hands up. I'm just going to go in order on my screen. Lawrence, go ahead. Yeah, just just putting it out there that uh, there is a, a containment um, measure that was uh, that is shown on the plans that was reviewed and approved by Aaron last year, um, and we we've maintained that within this plan set. Um, the uh, and, and the reason and just to explain some context about why it's probably going to take some time with the fire department. So. Um, obviously, it, it pairs back to the fact that the, the company that we selected that is going to provide the batteries power in had a fire at a site in, in Warwick in New York. Um, they have carried out a root cause analysis that has determined the, 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 the cause of it. Um, but at the moment, we're covered under an NDA. So it's not something that we can publicly talk about until we get the authorization from them um, to, to, to discuss the RCA. They are getting close to that point, but it, it may be January or February before we can uh, have those free conversations with the fire department, which uh, I would expect them to want and we're more than happy to have. But there's no point in me having the conversation with the fire department in January, just talking generally about things um, when there would be um, specific questions and things that would come out over what that cause was, what's been done to address it and, and, uh, and, and anything that needs to be incorporated on this if that makes sense. So um, it was really just to, um, and I understand what Aaron's saying about having the final plan and that kind of stuff, um, but it was really just to, uh, to, to deal with the fire department permission um, as a condition, um, uh, it, it, one of the order of conditions that, it, that we will need to do that before any batteries are installed, rather than us having to go through the, that approval process now to get the order of conditions issued. So. Okay, thanks. Lawrence, Sean, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I was going to just reiterate what what Lawrence said is is that we do have a secondary containment system for the batteries. Um, they're kind of odd because they don't have a lot of fluids in them, right? Um, I think there has been some discussion on the call, like the the, the cabinets are watertight. Um, I can't speak to that other project in town why they put a roof on it. Um, that's not typical design, so. Um, but I will say they're designed as watertight um, systems. Um, regardless, there is a secondary containment system for any anything that could get out that 
you know, uh, we wouldn't be, you know, shouldn't be getting out. I, and I think there was just some confusion on on what maybe Matt was saying and, and maybe one of Aaron's comments too, that I just want to make sure it's um, clear. I think, I think the, uh, what, what I think where our understanding, right, was that the roadway work was considered an existing condition, right? Um, that roadway work was done um, improved previously and it's and it's completed and part of that process was the approval of the width of the road and during that process with the fire department the radii of the turning radiuses where they turn around was enlarged so on the plans you do see these what we call hammerheads and turnarounds those are solely for fire department access um, that's not for maintenance equipment at all um, that's for the larger um, vehicles, um, you know, to come in and out of the site. So I know there's a long history to this project. I'm not necessarily knowledgeable of all of it. <laughs> Maybe most of the people on the call probably aren't, right? Um, but th th there, there was conversations in coordination with the fire department to get us to that previous approval and, and get that built. So I, I just want to put that out there for that understanding that it's it's not like we've never coordinated with the fire department and we've we've just gotten here without their sign off to that there was coordination with them historically on on spe specifically the radii of where they would turn because that's their their number one concern um and and i'm not even sure if the same people at the fire department were part of that are, are still there as part of that conversation um that those pieces I, i'm not i'm not sure of right because I think the project's gone so long. I think we've just brought in new people, but I just want to set the stage for that. I, I think it's important because I don't want this to sound like we're doing this in a bubble. There has been a process to get us where we are, right? And um, and maybe that, maybe some of that's gotten lost in translation a little bit. Okay, understood. Thank you, Sean. Lawrence, I see your hand up. Um, I'm really trying to move on at this point. So do you have something quickly to add? Okay. Nothing. I have absolutely nothing to add. It was raised in error. I apologize. Okay, no problem. All right, um, we do have one public comment. Mike Lipinski, um, I'm allowing you to talk, please, if you may, just keep it to two minutes. Yes, I'd just like to fill in a few um, facts that are missing in the discussion tonight that the Conservation Committee should be aware of. Um, Mr. Cook has referred to one fire involving these Poland batteries. And there's been at least another one in October of uh, 2023. Sorry, yeah, October 4th, actually. And that involved the same, either the exact same battery they're trying to use or a similar one where nine individual cabinets caught on fire. So it's a big problem for Poland. And it seems to be a big problem this this particular company, Pure Sky, because even though it's it's been proven that these things have some fault that has caused them to catch on fire, rather than abandon this particular battery and substitute any other batteries that are out there, which would move the process along really quickly, they want to stick with this for whatever reason. Perhaps they've already purchased them. Um, it's really not clear because they're kind of tight-lipped about it. But the thing is, you guys shouldn't take this as it's your fault that you're slowing down the process. At any point in time, they could switch to a battery that wouldn't have any controversy that the fire department would look at and say, no problem, let's go. But they're sticking with a battery company and a particular model of battery that is still not clear why they're catching on fire. And even if it they do issue a report that says everything's okay, we're ready to go. You have to understand that where the beta testing for that is going to take place is going to be at Hickory Ridge because they won't have those batteries out in the field. Whatever caused the original fire in the batteries that they put out in the field in New York and in Idaho, they won't have tested for that. And so this new improved fixed battery system is now going to be installed in Hickory Ridge, and it's the town of Amherst that will be doing the testing. They could solve this problem really easily, switch to a different battery, a safe battery with a long history of being safe, and the, the process could continue 
very quickly. The only reason why it's being dragged out, at least as far as the batteries go, is because they're hanging on to this Pone Centipede 750 system, which so far has a really bad track record as far as fires go. And you should be aware of that and do your own research on it and see what some of those fires looked like. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, I'm just going to take, sorry, Mike, we're just trying to um, get this going sure, no and edit for link. Thanks for um, your public comment. Commissioners, I just want to take a quick poll. I see Lawrence's hand is up um, about who is in favor of continuing this right now or who wants to continue the conversation. Okay, so uh, in favor of continuing, hand up. Um, continuing sure. now you, as in closing. Could you clarify what you mean by continuing? Yeah, I'm sorry. In favor of motioning to continue now and closing this hearing, not the public hearing, raise your hand. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Lawrence. We'll be back, obviously, um, but I think that we've sort of reached our max on this hearing for tonight. So, um, Jason, go ahead. No, nope, hands up. Okay. All right. With that, um, I'm going to make look for a motion to continue this hearing to January 10th. Alex, I see your hand up. I have one quick comment, Michelle. Go ahead. I just want to say that as a commissioner, I'm not particularly interested in working on a project which may be segmented. I would rather work with the whole project than than segments of a project. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. I move to. I move uh, to. What's that? <laughs> I move to continue the public hearings for one ninety one West Pomeroy Fort River Soul Solar LLC notice of intent to one ten twenty four at eight p.m. I'll second that. All right, Jason on the motion. Andre on the second. Alex. Aye. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. Em and I. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Back to SWCA. Not forgotten. Okay. So this is a notice of intent for SWCA on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for the construction of a gravel parking lot and associated stormwater structures in the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetation, vegetated wetland at lot 13 Olympia Drive at 8D, lot 15, 16, and 3. So we are still waiting on some input from this one, unless there's any comments and looking for a motion to continue. Move to continue the public hearing for lot 13 Olympia Drive, notice of intent to 7.55 p.m. on one. Oh, I think we have a. Yeah, I think. Uh... Okay, got it. Back on uh, that motion. Okay, is that Andre on the motion? Alex on the second. Alex. Aye. Jason. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Andre. Aye. I'm an I. Okay, I think we have. <laughs> One more up, that is 30 Kestrel Lane, DEP. Do we have anyone? Yeah. Um, so I had a little communication with the owner um, at 30 Kestrel kind of late this afternoon. Um, they did send me a, a PowerPoint presentation that has some photos. If the commission would like, I can share those with you now. Um, it's kind of at your discretion, but I'll I'll let you know what um, uh, I guess the um, the situation is. So um, the the owners of Thirty Kestrel came before the Conservation Commission with a um, a notice of intent application probably about a year ago um, for. Um, the construction of a uh, sort of a lean-to storage structure on their property um, for the storage of a boat. And so they went through the permitting process for that, um, and they were issued an order of conditions. Um, the owner uh, reached out to me a couple weeks ago that um, they were building a shed slash play structure in their backyard um, 
and their neighbor stopped them and said, hey, I think you need a permit from the Conservation Commission. So he reached out to me and said, I'm building this structure um, and uh, my neighbor alerted me that I need a permit from the Conservation Commission. So I said to him, you, you can try to amend your order of conditions to include this structure and or you could file a request for determination. Based on what he told me, the the play structure slash shed is located um, within the 50 foot no touch buffer um, to a wetland on the site. So he opted to file an amendment to the um, order of conditions, which is why this is on the agenda. Um, I'm having trouble downloading. I, I had requested site visit photos. Um, I know Bruce went out and took a ride by and he said it looked like it was either fully constructed or partially no, constructed? No. Partial. Partially, okay. Partially it's just a, a frame. Okay. Um, the, it was a little unclear, the materials that were submitted to us because, so the original plan showed a wetland delineation line, but it didn't extend to the back of the property where this structure is um, being requested to be placed. Um, what the request included was a, a GIS map that showed the DEP um, wetland layer and there was a, a line drawn to the wetland layer. So I reached back out to the owner and said, um, we can't use the DEP wetland layer. Um, we really have to rely on a wetland delineation. And he said that there was still flags from when um, Ward had done the original delineation. They just weren't picked up by survey in the back of the lot. So that was kind of a new piece of information for me. And I said, okay, well, you can still present tonight. And he said, here's my PowerPoint. I'm not going to be there. So for whatever reason, it's not allowing me to download the PowerPoint um, at this point. I'm, I just tried to download it. He only sent it to me at like six, uh, seven o'clock tonight. Um, <clears throat> so I can't share it with you. So I think we're kind of at a point where we can't really approve it tonight, but um, the concept of having a site visit might not be a bad idea just so that everyone can sort of see what's going on out there before the next meeting. Thanks, Aaron. Um, raise your hand if you're in favor of a site visit or be interested in it. Okay, that's a, that's a lot. Friday. Sorry, say again. As long as it's not this Friday. Okay. Okay, I think we can make that happen. Okay, so we'll table that to the next meeting. That's no problem. And sorry for the long-winded explanation. Thank you for the background. Okay, I think we've gotten through all of our items. So I am going to just take one last public comment call. Give a couple seconds. Seeing none. I'm looking for a motion to close. Oh, to adjourn. adjourn. To adjourn. I don't know. I think Andre got that one. <laughs> I'll second it. <laughs> I'll second right. it. Andre on the motion. Jason on the second. Alex. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Bruce. Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Good work, everyone. Thank you for That's staying up late. Good night, you. all. Thanks, everyone. And a happy Aaron. holidays. Happy See, holidays. You oh, yeah. See you next year. Oh, yeah. See you next year. Yeah. I have a question for Aaron before she leaves the arena. Okay. Everybody, okay. I think we can all leave and they can hang out. I just want to ask a question about the note. Sure. All right. Happy New Year, everyone. Bye. You too. Bye bye. Go ahead, Bruce. Just, um, I have some questions. What time will you be around tomorrow? Um, tomorrow. Um, let's see. Um, I believe I have, I will be tied up from about 10 to noon. Other than that, I think I am. Uh, okay. Well, around. just send me the tape and, and I can ask my questions in the afternoon. Okay. That sounds good. Have you Thank stopped? You. Have you stopped recording? Um, no, I have not. <laughs>